This talk is to assist with the understanding and management of ovarian hyperstimulation. My name is Associate Professor Ray O'Sullivan. I work in St. Luke's Hospital in Kilkenny. also work with Repromed and the Royal College of Surgeons. It's true to say that all women undergoing ovarian stimulation are at risk of developing uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. In Ireland, it's said that the incidence uh, is about 0.8%. The processes that cause ovarian hyperstimulation are not fully understood, but are characterized by increasing capillary permeability, leading to leakage of fluid from the vascular compartment with third place fluid accumulation intravascular dehydration. Also as features are hypoalbuminemia, hemoconcentration, electrolyte imbalances. There's also decreased perfusion of the kidneys and reduced urinary output, uh, accumulation of fluid in the abdominal cavity and also in the pleural spaces and occasionally in the pericardium. It may precipitate significant morbidity and mortality from uh, venous thromboembolism may also cause renal and liver failure and also respiratory failure. The ovaries typically are enlarged and when they are, there is the possibility of ovarian torsion and cyst rupture. Ovarian hyperstimulation does occur in the presence of administered exogenous HCG. The condition fortunately is usually self-limiting and resolves spontaneously within several days, but may persist for a longer duration, particularly if the patient does become pregnant. The risk factors for developing ovarian hyperstimulation are the presence of polycystic ovarian syndrome, elevated AMH levels, which often goes with polycystic ovarian syndrome, increased ovarian volume, a high antral follicle count on a baseline scan, younger women, patients with that are thin, patients that have previously had hyperstimulation, high doses of stimulation uh, medications, large numbers of oocytes collected, collected, and a rapidly rising or high estradiol levels greater than 17,000. It's typically divided into four categorizations. When it's mild, it may consist, consist of mild abdominal pain with some abdominal bloating and a variant size less than eight centimeters. When it's described as moderate, the pain is described as moderate. Patients may have nausea or vomiting. There is ultrasound of evidence of some ascites, and the ovarian size is somewhere between 8 and 12 centimeters. When it's severe, there can be quite severe abdominal pain. There can be clinical ascites, usually with abdominal distension, and also a hydrothorax characterized by dyspnea. They may have reduced urine production. Their hematocrit is greater than 45. There's a reduced hypoproteinemia, or protein levels, especially albumin, and the ovarian sizes are, le are greater than 12 centimeters. When the patient is considered very unwell with this condition, they have a tense ascites or a large hydrothorax with pleural effusions. The hematocrit is greater than 55. White cell count is greater than 25,000. They're producing very little or no urine. They may also have had a venous thromboembolic event and they have acute respiratory distress syndrome. When patients do present with any of these features, the examination initially should consist of their body weights, abdominal circumferences, heart rate monitoring and blood pressure monitoring, and the cardiovascular and respiratory systems need to be looked at as well as the abdomen. Pelvic examination, it is said, should be avoided as this may induce cyst rupture and the ovaries are already enlarged and tender. The diagnosis is based on clinical criteria, but the following investigations may aid in ascertaining the severity and response to treatment. When a patient's thought to have ovarian, a severe ovarian hyperstimulation, a full blood count should be performed. Uh, it's considered severe if the hematocrit is greater than 55. White cell counts greater than 25,000 are also, also put patients in the severe category. Hyponatremia of greater than 135, of less than 135 millimoles, hyperkalemia um, of five or more, creatinine uh, of 0 0.1 or less, the or more. Liver function tests may be elevated. The albumin levels may also be reduced, and there may be coagulation defects. Elevated fibrinogen levels and reduced antithrombin three may be present, and HCG 
will be positive in the pregnant patients that often get worse, especially if 10 days or more after oocyte retrieval. On ultrasound, the ovaries may be enlarged with multiple ovarian cysts, ascites will be present, and Doppler studies may be performed if there is severe unilateral pain uh, with a suspicion of ovarian torsion. Other indicated uh, examinations include arterial blood, blood gases, if the patients are very dyspneic and there's a suspicion of respiratory failure. The D-dimers also may be elevated in the presence of venous thromboembolism. Uh, should patients be exhibiting uh, cardiac features, an ECG and echo may be uh, employed to look for pericardial fusions. Patients may also require chest x-rays to demonstrate pleural effusions and interstitial edema, and a CT pulmonary angiogram or a VQ scan uh, to assist with the definitive diagnosis of a pulmonary embolism. Typically, the management of area hyperstimulation is supportive, and the admission and admission to hospital reserve typically for cases of severe hyperstimulation. The natural history is one of gradual resolution over 10 to 14 days, unless pregnancy occurs and the symptoms may persist for a longer period of time. Some patients are suitable in the mild and moderate groups for outpatient management and the severity of symptoms will dictate, dictate the need for admission and these milder cases can be management as a, managed as an outpatient as long as they have the ability to return for regular and frequent visits, typically every two to three days. If they're being managed in an outpatient setting, a daily fluid balance uh, should be performed, daily weight and girth checks should be performed, and blood and scans, blood tests and scans should be performed. Other things to consider is the use of analgesia, typically paracetamol and codeine, avoiding non-steroidals as these may, af may affect renal function. Luteal phase support in the form of progesterone and not HCG is employed. Hydration um, is very important in any patient with hyper uh, hyperstimulation. And in the outpatient setting, patients are asked to drink to thirst rather than drinking excessively. They're asked to avoid strenuous exercise and sexual intercourse as injury or torsion to these enlarged ovaries may occur. Blood should be taken uh, every two to three days. Uh, if the ascites is tense and is causing some difficulty for the patient, this may be drained. And if symptoms do not resolve, patients then should be admitted and considered to be more severe and different strategies employed. So for patients who have symptoms of severe ovarian hyperstimulation, they should be referred and managed in a hospital. Uh, there should be liaison with the IVF team. And the following circumstances dictate the need for admission. You admit them if they cannot ingest oral fluids, if they have vomiting or diarrhea, if they are hypotensive, if they have dyspnea and decreased breath sounds, if they have a tense distended abdomen or peritonism, and certainly if there are features of venous thromboembolism. As I said earlier, the management is essentially supportive until the condition resolves spontaneously. The following parameters should be monitored. Their abdominal girth and weight on admission and daily. Blood pressure, pulse, respiratory rate every four hours. An input-output balance should be um, maintained, especially with the use of an indwelling catheter. Daily blood should include full blood count, coagulation screen, ureal electrolytes, and liver function tests. More specifically, in the severe cases, the issues of thromboembolism should be considered, and all patients should be using TED stockings, and also prophylactic anticoagulant therapy with low molecular weight heparins, and these should be administered at a dose determined according to patients' weights. Hydration can be challenging in these patients because they are losing fluids into the third spaces. Patients are encouraged to drink to thirst if that is possible. If she cannot tolerate fluids orally, then intravenous fluids such as normal saline should be commenced. The volume should be titrated using the hematocrit as an indicator of the state of hydration. And of interest, and importantly, excess IV fluids may make the condition worse. Diuretics are contraindicated when hemoconcentration hemo is present, as these can make matters vastly worse. The only time that these could be used in the presence of a normal hematocrit. Women with severe hemoconcentration require an initial bolus of 500 mils of fluid on admission. Plasma expanders can also be used slowly to a maximum dose, but this should be, I mean, this should be performed under circumstances where 
we avoid lung congestion. Albumin should also be used but kept for a later stage once the patient does become hypo hypoalbuminuric um, and this can be quite useful especially if you're draining the ascites and typically about 100 mils per day uh, based on the severity of the low albumin levels and the total volume of acidic fluid um, drained. Drainage of ascites can be performed abdominally and vaginally but typically uh, should be performed using ultrasound. It should be considered in women with severe abdominal distension, in women with dyspnea and women with renal impairment and paracentesis typically results in increased venous return, increased cardiac output, increases uh, urinary production and renal function and also improves lung function. The drainage will take place abdominally or vaginally under ultrasound guidance. Typically, the rate of drainage is slow to prevent cardiovascular collapse, usually 2 litres in a 12-hour hour period. You need to monitor the blood pressure, and this requires continuous monitoring throughout the period of drainage. And a pigtail catheter used and antibiotics to cover the process. If patients further deteriorate, they will need to be admitted to an intensive care unit. And this usually will occur in the general hospital setting. And this occurs when there's increasing abdominal pain, reduced urinary production, increased weight gain, uh, abdominal girths increasing, and dyspnea to the point of uh, respiratory failure. And also, it is useful to get the engagement of other professionals uh, in this scenario. The criteria for admitting to an intensive care setting are there's either no or very little urine production or a failure to respond to fluid management or paracentesis. Respiratory compromise, not responding to diuresis or paracentesis, as the patient may also require ventilation. The clinic appearance of acute respiratory distress syndrome, the presence of venous thromboembolism, the large tense societies or hydrothorax or pleural effusion, the matocrits of greater than 55 and the white cells greater than 25,000. When these occur, patients should be admitted to the intensive care setting. So hopefully that helps explain what ovarian hyperstimulation is and this gives us a further understanding should any further patients uh, be admitted to our unit. Thank you.